Hey guys, it's Don here for the OSBGL and I'm here on my own today with a bit of a different video. It's a, a new series called Battle Company Breakdown. And I'm on my own because Garrett's off on vacation this week. Uh, so I thought I would try to come up with something uh, that I can film on my own when uh, we have trouble getting together. Uh, or when I have a little bit of free time. So we'll see how this one is received. Uh, if people enjoy it, I'll, I'll continue on with some other videos in this series. But for this one, we are going to talk about the Isengard faction. Uh, battle Company Breakdown, what it's going to be. Obviously, it's about battle companies. It's become my favorite part of SBG. Uh, really loving the, the battle companies and I actually prefer really small games so the battle companies is uh, right up my alley uh, and so what I thought I would do is I would do a review uh, I probably won't do all of the factions but we'll do a fair number of them if uh, this is well received and it'll be basically, uh, we'll be talking about uh, the faction itself, the starting models, um, the upgrades they can get, but we'll also go into uh, their war gear, uh, the best equipment for that war band, we'll talk about tactics on the battlefield, and in how to build your war band, and I will showcase some models. Uh, so hopefully I'll have to probably restrict this to armies that I do have models for. And my painting is not the best in the world, it's okay, but it'll give you a good idea of uh, the models in each faction. Okay, so we're here to talk about Isengard, the Urukai. Uh, as the White Wizard has fallen from grace, Isengard has done much the same. Gone are the trees and green fields, uprooted, destroyed, and replaced by machines and industry. The fires of Isengard never cease, the forges constantly churning out weapons, armor, and contraptions of war in order to arm Saruman's fighting Urukai against the races of men, elves, and dwarves. Saruman regularly sends forth companies of Urukai to raid and burn villages of men, spreading fear and panic to increase the wizard's dominance. None felt this more than the land of Rohan, whose settlements and villages were burned to the ground by these hands. The Urukai who led these warbands are vicious and bloodthirsty warriors, the very best of Saruman's fledgling army, looking to prove themselves worthy to lead the White Wizard's eventual siege upon Helm's Deep. So that's the preamble for the warband, and I like the phrase where it says, uh, where is it now? Vicious and bloodthirsty warriors, because that kind of describes this warband in a nutshell. There's not a lot of finesse to this warband, um, this warband, at least when it starts out, is an in-your-face warband. Um, so we'll get into that as we go through this, but let's talk about the starting battle company that you have with this warband. So most battle companies, like the average number of models you start with with a battle company is six. Obviously some have more, some have less. Um, but generally speaking, you're looking at about six for a lot of the battle companies. This warband starts with seven. You get two Urukai scouts, three Urukai scouts with shield, and two Urukai scouts with Urukai bow. It actually says orc bow in the uh, in the book, but there is an errata that's been released that says that all instances of orc bow for this warband are changed to Urukai Bow, which is good because Urukai Bow is strength three, not strength two. Um, so there you go, you start with seven models. Uh, so that is a good force to start with. Um, this warband also has advancements for some of its warriors um, and not all warbands do. So you can have your Urukai Scout with a shield 
get promoted to an Urukai warrior with shield. You can have your Urukai scout promote to an Urukai warrior with a pike, and you can have your Urukai scout with Urukai bow promote up to an Urukai warrior with a crossbow, which is awesome. Um, the reinforcement table for this warband is also good because they have a special chart that you can get if you roll a six. But let's go through it from the beginning. One, of course, is nothing. Two is an Urukai scout. Three is an Urukai scout with choice of weapon. Four is an Urukai warrior with shield. Five is an Urukai warrior with choice of weapon, which would be pike, crossbow, or shield. And six is roll on the special chart. And the special chart, it only has two results. One to three is a feral Urukai, and four to six is an Urukai berserker. Uh, the army specific hero upgrade. It's called You Shall Taste Man Flesh. The hero's lust for flesh drives them into a bloodthirsty rage, spurring them forth into battle. This hero receives a bonus of plus one to wound when making strikes against models with the man keyword. So wow, that seems really good. Plus one to wound is awesome. And this warband has something that very few other warbands have, and that is they have a unique piece of war gear called Urukai Grog. It's worth two points for who's ever holding it to their profile, and it's a small piece of war gear. Uh, only heroes can get it, and it costs four influence points. And it is a hero may elect to use their Urukai Grog at the start of any game. If they do so, Remove it from the hero model's profile. Every model within the hero model's battle company may re-roll a single d6 when making a dual roll for the duration of that game. Wow, so that is really good. Uh, and it is just for Isengard. So they have their own personal piece of war gear. So that's the warband in a nutshell. Uh, again, nothing subtle about this faction. Uh, vicious, bloodthirsty melee fighters. Uh, but they're armed with probably the best shooting weapon in the game, in the crossbow. Okay, the great bow is technically the best in the game. But for battle companies, it's really not a thing. Um, so to all intents and purposes, the crossbow is the best shooting weapon in battle companies. Um, and if your opponent uh, doesn't have a lot of shooting or has a lot of cavalry, uh, you can choose to sit back and, and shoot before getting into melee. Um, and if they're going to outshoot you, then you just charge with everything because your bowmen are actually really good melee fighters still. And it's always a good idea for this warband to stay together as much as possible. I think that's a fairly common thing with most warbands that are, um, like unless you're like a skirmishing warband, you try to keep your, your warband together. Okay, now we're going to go through some pros and cons of the Isengard faction. Okay, really big pro for this warband is their starting warband is way above average in terms of quality. Um, just because you're starting out with seven models and those models are all fight for and strength for. I mean, that fact alone should win you a bunch of your early games. And you know that is a huge advantage right out of the gate it's a it's an easy army uh, to play early on because you can let the stats the profiles work for you and and win the day basically the warband also has access to a lot of key war gear uh, they can get heavy armor which a lot of warbands can't they can get shields 
crossbows. So yeah, those weapons uh, and war gear there are the really important ones. You can get heavy armor and shield to protect your guys, and you got a really good shooting weapon. They've got warrior advancements available. Uh, you know, they're not fantastic advancements. You're basically, you know, uh, advancing a scout into an Urukai warrior, which means you're just gaining heavy armor, really. Um, but in the case of the the bowman, you're also getting uh, your Urukai uh, bow turned into a crossbow. So, so that's decent, very decent. And having an advancement is like, it's kind of a critical or key part of battle companies because you want to be able to track your experience and you know have a chance for your guy to get better so it, it's a fun part of the game that I, I think all war bands should have advancements i think you know the ones that don't currently have advancements it would be good even as a house rule to add something in to to let those warriors have a chance to advance and again another pro they have a unique piece of war gear that is actually really good that nobody else can get so those are the pros, the cons, and there certainly are some uh, cons, and there's one really big one, and this one basically means that this will not be a top tier warband. You know, if we're scoring these things on uh, a score of five, uh, I'm gonna say competitively, this is probably not gonna ever get to a five, and that's simply because they don't have cavalry. And cavalry in SVG is well I'll just say it it's OP it's 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 good to the point of being too good um, and you know when a warband doesn't have it it's it's a drawback for sure because not only do they not have the cavalry it means that their heroes can't get mounts so a big con there um, these guys don't have access to spears. They do have access to pike, but not to spears. Um, you know, throwing a spear on your guy can always be helpful. Uh, in battle companies, I don't think pikes and spears are as important as they are in the main game, simply because it's there's so few models on the table, it's hard to actually form a line of battle. And in most games, like the majority of your models end up in base-to-base -base contact anyways. So having a spear is less useful than in the main game, but it is still a drawback. Um, one of the special units that Ur the Urukai or the Isengard faction can get, uh, they can get Feral Urukai and Berserkers. Well, Feral Urukai uh, took a major hit in the new edition, and now they're Defense 4 which means they're extremely fragile. Um, they're a good model on the offense, but if they lose a fight, they die. And they often get targeted by missile weapons because with a strength two bow, you only need to roll a five to knock them out. So that's a bit of a, a bummer getting a special unit and it's a defense four guy, but it is what it is. Another one is in this game you can get creatures, like a good example you see a lot of uh, is a hunting dog that men and hobbits can get, or orcs can get a warg. Well, unfortunately the Urukai of Isengard got the short end of the stick here and there's nothing for them other than the pack horse. Um, and the pack horse, although it does have some use in uh, a utility kind of way, helping you save money on war gear, it doesn't give you an additional combat model. Like most warbands uh, can get 15, but your sergeant, your two sergeants, and your leader can all get uh, a creature added to their war gear. So, you know, you could have orcs that get three wargs or, or men that get three dogs. And they're not awesome combat models, but they are very useful and, and mo mobile help you get traps, help you seize objectives, all of this kind of stuff. And Urukai, they just don't have that. They are truly stuck at 15. Evil factions, which uh, Isengard obviously is, also don't have access to Elvish Waybread, which I think is probably the best piece of equipment in the game, simply because it's a, a major insurance policy for your heroes when they become big and 
um, really good. You buy them an Elvish whey bread and whenever they get knocked out, you just use that and you automatically take a full recovery. You know, it is expensive. I think it's worth three, but I mean, later in late game, it's critical and so good. The last con for them is uh, their faction special rule, Taste Man Flesh. It is a five out of five special rule if you're playing against another faction that has a lot of men in it. So if you're playing uh, like Rohan or the Fiefdoms, Minas Tirith, uh, any of that, even if you're playing, you know, an evil warband, you know, Harad or, uh, you know, even Mordor, if they've got any Black Numenorians, they're men. Like, getting plus one to wound is the best bonus you can get in the game. So it is fantastic. The problem is, if you're playing a faction that has no men in it, like dwarves or elves or goblins or orcs or whatever, it's a zero out of five. So that one there, it's, you know, it's totally hit or miss. It's either, it's either fantastic and could win you the game, or it's basically a tax on your warband. And every three of those that you have, you're giving your opponent a reroll and a free point of influence at the end of the game for nothing. Okay, let's talk about war gear. Uh, first off, in the FAQ that came out, there was something about this under designer commentary. And the question is, for the purposes of promoting warrior models, is it the starting war gear or the war gear present at the time of promotion that determines what a model promotes into? Um, and the answer is a model will promote based on the war gear they currently hold at the time of promotion. In the question, they actually give an example, but I'm not going to go into that because I'm going to give an example that is for this faction. So a good example here is you can get a scout, an Urukai scout that has nothing but a sword. So the promotion for that model, if they should get one, is an Urukai warrior with pike. Okay, well, you're never going to leave that warrior with no war gear unless they just get to 5 XP and get promoted before you can afford to buy them something. But you're going to always want to buy them a shield or a bow, either a bow to max out your bow or a shield to give them a plus one defense to take them up to five and the ability to shield if they would need to. Also, because you don't want pikes. You really don't want pikes. An Urukai warrior with a shield or a crossbow is what you want. You don't want Urukai warriors with pikes. Uh, they're just not nearly as good as the other two options. You're not gonna be trying to form up a pike block in battle companies, it just doesn't happen. Um, so here, if you give your Urukai scout a shield, he promotes into an Urukai warrior with a shield. If you give him a bow, he promotes into an Urukai warrior with crossbow. Anyway, this warband has a really good selection of war gear. They've got a shield, they've got Urukai bow, which is a really good weapon, uh, strength 3, range 18. Um, they've got a crossbow, again, best shooting weapon in battle companies. They can get two-handed weapons. Uh, they can upgrade to heavy armor. And, of course, they can swap out their hand weapons. So they got a really good selection of war gear to play with there. Um, the most important piece, if you had to pick one, is going to be the shield. Uh, make sure to give all of your scouts a shield unless you're going to give them the Urukai bow. Heavy armor, you're going to want to take the heavy armor upgrade for all of your heroes as soon as possible. The only one you're not going to take that for is if you have anyone that's going to take the path of the scout because scouts can't have heavy armors. But like warriors, generals, adventurers, and even a sorcerer should be upgraded to like heavy armor and shield. Um, the only warriors that you should be giving two-handed weapons to are, uh, or sorry, the only heroes you should be giving two-handed weapons to are ones on the warrior path. And only give it to them 
when they roll up deadly strength, which gives them burly. Before that, just keep them with the shield. Um, of course, if you have a berserker, they have a two-handed weapon or a hand and a half weapon. Uh, and if they may become a shield or become a hero with a hero in the making, then you're just gonna you're just gonna leave that with them like that. Rangers, uh, you're gonna make sure your rangers are equipped with crossbows. Uh, yeah, it's just if you have uh, a bowman become a hero, then you're gonna want to buy him a crossbow as quickly as possible. If you have a room on your bow cap. Uh, try to give your sorcerer an Urukai bow and you can actually get kind of like a really weird combo that you can't otherwise get in this faction and that is an Urukai bow and a pike. Um, you know the rules writers already uh, nerfed the pike crossbow thing and it's not possible to get Urukai bow and pike uh, in the actual army, the SPG army. Uh, but in this faction, a hero can get both those weapons, and there's there's no penalty for that. And it's actually a decent thing for a sorcerer to have, because they're only going to ever have one attack anyways. So you may as well have that ability to use it from a supporting position if you can. And having a bow on your sorcerer just gives them another way to reach out and inflict damage on the enemy. Okay, what about equipment for this faction? Uh, well, they're evil, which means there's certain pieces of equipment they can't have, and there's certain pieces of equipment that only evil can have. And probably the biggest bang for your buck uh, as far as equipment is going to go is blade poison. Only evil can get it. It only costs one. It's only worth one point. Um, but it allows you to reroll your wound rolls of a one and because your strength is four you have a really decent chance of uh, inflicting a wound on the reroll so you know as soon as you can afford it put that on all of your heroes it doesn't scale up either the points when your guys become better uh, it stays at one point um, what you would maybe consider even doing is if you have any warriors that are berserkers give it to them too because they have two attacks um, I probably wouldn't invest in it in the ferals just because they tend to die easier because they get knocked out in almost every game rangers you're gonna have at least a one or two rangers in your warband uh, concealing quote cloak is good rangers did get a bit of a nerfing in this edition uh, and one of the nerfs they took was that they only can get two wounds now. So certainly having a concealing cloak is going to help. You can keep your guy back. He's going to be staying back probably anyways once he becomes really good with expert shot, two shots. Um, you're going to probably keep him back in cover. And with a concealing cloak, he can sit there all game long and pepper away. Uh, the war drum is another one that is quite good for this warband. Again, only evil can get it. Uh, it's large, it's worth 10 points, and it costs 3 influence to buy. Um, but because this warband doesn't have access to cavalry, uh, that is one way to move yourself across the table quickly. Uh, and if you're playing an archery army that's going to outshoot you, it can be very handy to have one of those. Dwarven Brew or the Scroll of Courage, they're both the same item, it's just one is large and one is small. Uh, but if you know you're going up against a terror causing faction, uh, like the Dead of Dunharrow or you know, you're going to be, again, like Black Numenorians or anything that causes terror. Um, you have one of those in your warband and you use it at the start of the game. Every model within the Hero Models Battle Company adds plus one to their courage value for the remainder of the game. Okay, yeah, it's the company standard that allows you to re-roll courage tests. Also another good uh, item. For this one here, it's not critical to have it. I think you could probably get away with just having the, the Dwarven Brew or the Scroll of Courage. Um, and it is they are a lot less expensive. Six influence points for the company standard versus two. Um, so there you go. Uh, lastly, and this is kind of a weird one, um, it's the Rally Horn. 
So it's five influence points and it's worth five points added onto your guy. So it's expensive, but if you can get this early campaign, it will pay for itself like two times over at least. Because what it does is it'll allow you to add one to your reinforcement rules. And it also has, uh, has an effect in one uh, scenario, uh, which may come up like, you know, once or twice, but the, the, what you're really paying for is the plus one. So uh, over the course of many games and many reinforcement rules, that thing will earn its value back for sure. And the big advantage of it means that you don't have to keep one influence in your bank as insurance against rolling a one. Okay, so the second edition of Battle Companies has something really new and awesome in there. And they are paths for your heroes to follow. And they're like character classes in role playing. A really good addition to uh, this edition of the game. Um, and it really solves one of the problems that the previous edition had, which was that, you know, some of your heroes uh, previously could get like ridiculously out of control by switching between, you know, different um, sections of abilities and you, you end up cherry picking a lot of the best abilities and your characters just get completely out of control. So the paths are really putting a lid on that. Um, simply because they spread out all of the best abilities between the eight different paths and generally speaking every path can only get two of the really good ones like if you roll a 2 or a 12 are generally the really good abilities uh, so that's really sort of calmed that whole situation down there are eight paths in the game and two of them cannot be taken by any Urukai heroes. One is the Path of the Beast uh, and the other one is the Knight. Now it is possible I guess uh, if you're playing in a narrative campaign that you may end up getting a mount as a reward. I know I've seen that in one of the narrative campaigns but other than that you're not going to be getting a mount and therefore won't be using the Knight Path. So you're going to be using the other six uh, the three that I normally start the game with uh, for Isengard are Warrior, General, and Ranger. I would caveat that by saying if you're going into a campaign where you know you're playing against a lot of cavalry factions, then consider starting with a Sorcerer instead of a General. Uh, simply because you can like get your Sorcerer um, leveled up quickly and then having a sorcerer in your warband against a cavalry uh, army is very helpful because you can either transfix one of them per turn um, to sort of you know keep them from charging or you can even compel one forward so you get the charge off on the cavalry model it can be very helpful any of your crossbowmen that become promoted should be taken the path of the ranger without exception really. It's just that the combination of the crossbow and the ranger path, it's so good that it just doesn't make sense to take any other path. The path of the warrior is kind of like the default path for, for this warband because it's a melee warband and it's the best melee path. Um, you know, you start with strength uh, four and fight four, which means you can you can boost your strength and your fight up quicker than normal. And being able to get up to strength five in battle companies is absolutely huge because again, there's an exception I'm sure, but generally speaking, with strength five, you're going to wound anything in the game on the roll of a five. If you should have a feral urukai um, become a hero through hero in the making. Uh, they have a path that's actually really well suited to them and it is the path of the scout. Um, path of the scout you can only go on there if you have regular armor not heavy armor and feral urukais start with that so uh, that is good and they already have the maximum courage in the path which is five 
So if you were to roll that upgrade, it's an automatic reroll and everything else on that path is really good for a feral hero. You know, even if you roll the shoot upgrade to go to three plus shoot, you can still actually use it because you can get uh, throwing daggers or throwing weapons uh, with this. And you can get things that help you move through cover or uh, are more difficult to hit with shooting. Uh, it's a really good path for a feral. And kind of a really fun one for them to sort of progress through that as well. The last choice for path, and I think this pretty much goes for any warband, it's certainly for this one, is the adventurer. It's definitely the weakest path of, of all of them. Um, you know, it's not terrible, it's just not as good as the other ones. Um, it does have some decent abilities in it, but it it just kind of seems like a path that was cobbled together with the leftovers. The big problems with it are that it's uh, one of its two really good abilities is, or what should be really good abilities, is wilderness experience where you can re-roll any of your jump, uh, leap, and climb tests, etc. Uh, you know, it's okay, but for a top tier ability, it's pretty poor. The other thing is that this faction, or not this faction, this path can get up to a six courage. But what's the point of that when you have fearless also in the list? I mean, it seems like a redundant thing. Um, also, there are no access to any heroic actions in the adventure. And you can't get any special rules that either give you free might or free heroic actions. So again, just overall, it's the weakest path of, of all of them. Okay, what about tactics? And I'll divide this up into kind of like mid or early, mid and late campaign sort of tactics. And it's not just on how to play, but it's on also on how to build your, your battle company. Uh, so early campaign, because you start out with a really strong warband, uh, like we said before, it's got seven guys, fight four, strength four, you just want to charge at the other guy. You want to get into melee as quickly as possible uh, and as many one-on-one -on -one fights as you can get because your fight four and your strength four, those, those two stats will win you the game. Uh, the only time you're going to stand back is you're going to keep your entire warband back and shoot with your, your few bows that you have if the other opponent doesn't have any shooting or their orcs with orc bows. You know, you just shoot until you kill a couple and then advance with everybody. But at this stage, kind of the goal or the focus is to increase the number of models in your warband. So that's where all your influence is going to be going. You're going to be spending it on reinforcement rolls. Again, if you can, if you should end up lucky enough to come into a little bit of a windfall in terms of uh, influence, pick yourself up a rally horn. You know, if you have if you have somebody roll wounds of a hero and they, you know, get an extra four or five or six influence, throw it into a rally horn early and you won't regret it. Um, the only things you should be spending on anything other than reinforcement rolls early on uh, is to pick up like a couple of key pieces of war gear and it's for the scouts that you roll up that don't come with any weapons. Get them a shield or get them an Urukai bow because it'll make those models better and it'll ensure you get a better promotion instead of a guy with a pike. Uh, mid campaign. So at this point your focus is going to start to shift away from getting more guys because now you're going to end up having probably 10 or more models in your warband. Um, and you're going to sort of switch over to trying to improve the quality of your warband rather than quantity. So here is the time where you're going to try to add a lot of the key pieces of like equipment that we talked about earlier um, that are a little bit more expensive, you know, drums or a company standard 
or the scrolls and like that kind of thing that can that can really help your warband off or the Urukai Grog. Um, and it's also good at this point to start saving a little extra influence for your um, reinforcement rolls. If you don't have the rally horn or even if you do, it's always handy to have a couple of extra points of influence around uh, just so that you can boost your roll up. You can spend up to three influence points on uh, your reinforcement roll. And you know, if you're lucky enough to roll high, you can boost it up to a six. Or if you get onto the special chart and you roll a feral on a three, spend the point, get the berserker every time. Every time, that's well worth the one point. What about late campaign? Okay, so late campaign, you know, your warband is going to be pushing its max size. Uh, they're going to be really good. But the thing is your opponents are also going to be really good. Uh, so when you're playing uh, games in late campaign, you need to really take a close look at your opponent's warband and see where their strengths lie. Where are their tricks? Every warband is going to have a trick that they use to succeed. You know, whether it be um, heroes with um, free heroic combats or uh, whether you have like a sorcerer that's really good at compelling models uh, or you're really strong archery uh, any of this kind of stuff you have to look at the other warband and identify early what their strengths are and do everything that you can to sort of uh, prevent those things from working I mean that that's common in any warband um, but it's something that you have to do on the table uh, and the best way for you to do that in most cases is going to be with your shooting you're gonna at this point your crossbows are gonna start winning games for you you're gonna probably have at least two rangers in your warband at this point or one with uh, several other guys with crossbows and you want to use those to take out those key models that the guy your opponent has uh, take out their mounts on their big heroes, you know, take out their sorcerer, take out their like special unit they may have that that's, you know, depending on all their tricks. The big thing in late campaign is you got to be really cautious about enemy mounted heroes. One wrong move and those guys will ruin your day and cause you to lose the game. Um, you don't have any cavalry yourself to counter charge enemy cavalry so uh, you gotta use everything else at your disposal in order to deal with them uh, another piece of equipment at this point and it's a late game thing um, not because it's not good it's just because you don't want to invest the money in this one until late game and it's the seeing stone and it can help you seize priority which is key in games, again, against cavalry armies. So those are kind of my suggestions for tactics for early, mid, and late campaign for the Isengard Warband. Okay, so that's kind of it for this Warband, but let's kind of summarize uh, what we've talked about here in uh, describing just like how enjoyable or how competitive is the Isengard Warband to play. But I'm gonna score both of those categories uh, for Isengard as a four out of five. Um, from an enjoyment uh, standpoint, this Warband has a lot of different things happening. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not at all a boring warband to play. I mean, it comes with a good starting team. It, it's got advancements for you to track and use and participate in the like experience side of things, the sort of the role playing side. It's got a good reinforcement table that has a special, uh, re special chart. It's got, you know, a unique piece of war gear. Uh, and it's got some some guys that fit well into uh, the existing hero path. So you can make a really fun uh, battle company 
Uh, it's got plastic models that are easy to convert or easier to convert uh, if you're into doing that kind of stuff. Um, and it's quite a competitive battle company. I would say that early and late, it's good. It's, it's very competitive. The middle campaign time is going to be where you're going to struggle a little bit because you're going to find that you're not going to be able to deal with the cavalry opponents. Um, melee and shooting, you're going to be able to hold your own in both of those. But against cavalry, you know, you, you just don't have what it takes, and that is your own cavalry, to sort of deal with them. Um, but you start out strong uh, with a strong warband, and you're going to finish strong with crossbows and rangers. So from all sides, I think that I'm going to give this Warband a 4 out of 5, both competitive and just for enjoyment. Okay, so that's it for my first Battle Company breakdown. And it'll be up to you guys if there's going to be more, because uh, if it's well received uh, and people enjoy this kind of thing, I will gladly do more. I have lots of models, uh, I can field a lot of different uh, companies. so. You know, I have a wide array of stuff that I can do. Um, but if people aren't really interested in it, then, you know, we'll probably try something else instead. But let me know if there's something here that I should be talking about uh, in, in regards to warbands, you know, like pros and cons and tactics and, you know, whatever, if, if I'm missing something. Uh, leave a comment and tell me what you thought about the video, if you liked it, uh, you didn't like it, uh, all that stuff. Uh, and if you want to see another faction covered on this, let me know what it is. Anyway, that's it for now, and until next time, don't forget to get your toy soldiers out and come and play some games with us at the Ontario Strategy Battle Game League. See you next time, guys. Take care.